Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 211. Now this one is a special one for me, as it is with the first friend I ever made in my entire life. His name is J.D. Robb. And he and I have been friends since we were in kindergarten, and somehow, against all odds, have stayed in touch all this time, even though we live like a thousand miles away from each other. It's nuts! In this episode, we talk about how we met, how he became a Manchester United fan, which is uncommon given where we're from, uh, what it's like working in a marina, starting his own woodworking business, the process behind the different things he makes, and so much more. On that note, JD wanted to offer a special discount to anyone who comes his way via the show. How cool is that? So if you're in the market for some really cool custom woodwork, be it charcuterie boards, bowls, beer flights, signs, whatever else you can think of, JD is your man. Go to cedarbaywoodworks.com and let him know that I sent you for a 10% discount. As someone who has one of JD's pieces, I can say for certain, the man does quality work, and you will love it. But, before you go and do that, let's just get right into this and get to know the man himself. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 211, with JD Robb. Theme song time! You know what's crazy? So 99% of the time when I have someone on the show, it's someone I've never spoken to before. Okay. And we're, and we're getting to know each other as we go on. But you and I have the rare distinction of uh, being friends our whole lives, basically. Yes. Yes. And uh, it makes it a lot easier. I think so. But also, <laughs> it's kind of weird because I feel like this is an uncommon situation, like what we have. Yeah, because I mean, half the, half the conversation normally is, you know, you breaking the ice with someone else. Right. There's but, no more ice left for us. <laughs> no, no, it, it's just water that we're we're hanging That's out. It, in yeah, now. exactly. It's melted. We've been yep. friends for too long, JD. That's what happened. I know we're floating on rafts with uh, cold beers <laughs> in our hands. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> My God, because we're we were five. Yeah. Yeah. Five, it, was kinder, uh, it was kindergarten. Kindergarten. I met you when you fell through a, a fake brick wall. That's right. <laughs> you kind of landed in my lap, and I caressed you, like, "Hello, who are you? I'm, right. here, I'm here to I'm here to pick you back up." Right. And you haven't stopped. Thirty years in. <laughs> nope. We're still there. <laughs> <laughs> so, for people that don't know, so uh, where where are you from, JD? Where were you, where were you born? Uh, well, in Currituck, North Carolina. Yeah. Were you Elizabeth City as well, or was that just me? I was, I was born in Elizabeth City. Um, yeah, same. But we lived in Hertford, which is about forty miles west of where we're at now. You mm -hmm. know, until I was about four, until I started remembering things really, and then right. uh, we moved to Curry Tuck and Coin Jock, where I'm currently at. Moved mm -hmm. around a little bit in Curry within Curry Tuck, and now I'm back in Coin Jock. Dude, it's so strange. It, the other thing that's strange about our friendship is I left. Yes. <laughs> like a really early first on. grade. So for for context, so kindergarten, correct me if I'm wrong, because you know this was almost 30 years ago for both of us. The room, the classrooms, there were two separate classrooms because we weren't in the same class. Correct. But they had built this like cardboard brick wall made of like tiny little cardboard boxes that were painted like bricks, and it separated like an auditorium into two classrooms. Correct. And then me being me and my last name being ironic, I fell through the wall and you were on the other side of it. Yep. Just and you were just there gazing up into my eyes. Like Yep. And you were gazing down and we're like, are we are we best friends? <laughs> we're best friends. <laughs> Ever since <laughs> that's so straight. Like what are the odds? Because we weren't in the same class. Most people it's like you're in the same class and you spend a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. We just like the universe was like these two need to connect. That is correct. And and as kindergartners. And then after you left, you know, our parents stayed in touch because obviously we didn't have cell phones at five. Right. <laughs> um, like some of them do now. Right. But, um, 
you know, our parents kept in touch and kept us in touch. And then as we got older, we could communicate with each other. Yeah. And start planning those own trips to see each other. Yeah. Because you've been down three, three or four times, I think. Right. Something like that. Um, A couple let's times. See. At least three. I'm thinking four. Yeah. And I think I've I think... come back probably four or five. Yeah, probably a little bit more than I've come down there. I know, you know, I don't blame you. Kid, we came down with my mom a few times. And then as grown adults, we have come down uh, once. And I think you've made the trip up here probably three times since adulthood, so. maybe, maybe four. Yeah, I um, made it a few. Yeah. It's a, te- it's a testament to communication, everyone. For anyone that's it trying is. to have friends, that's all it takes. Because I was, we were friends at five. I moved that summer, right after I turned six, from North Carolina to Florida, and here we are, still pals. Yep. Craziness. You were in my wedding. I was. On my groomsmen, and I still have that Leatherman. Have you got your hearing back yet? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> that that's a good point. Yeah, let's talk about that. How you uh, almost took my hearing from me. Yeah, usually every time you come up here, you get into some kind of trouble. I know. <laughs> we so again, we're from North Carolina, right? There, there's a, there's a certain there are things that happen there that probably don't happen in other places, um, mm-hmm. like shooting guns in your backyard. That's yeah. not a normal thing to to a lot of people. For so hours at a time. For exactly, and so I I flew up for your wedding and um, mm-hmm. for your bachelor party. We just got guns and shot them in the backyard, and it was a great time. Um, yep. Except for there's this really cool invention that I think just came out called uh, ear protection. I think. Yes. Um, you guys had not heard of it, no, and never. Uh, <laughs> and I, I distinctly remember losing the losing my hearing in like stages. It was like <laughs> speaking speaking of a brick wall being built. It was like each shot that I fired because again the the rifle's right next to your ear. Each shot that I fired, it was like I lost twenty percent every bullet. So after five <laughs> bullets, I heard nothing. I, I my I busted my eardrums. And this was right before the rehearsal dinner. Yes. And so I went to your I went to your rehearsal dinner, uh, deaf, and I, I was snapping next to my ears, couldn't hear anything. <laughs> the fun thing about rehearsal dinners is you're rehearsing uh for a very important event. And I can't hear anything. <laughs> your, your wedding party is like, JD is a deaf friend. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know if they thought you were uh, deaf or um, unique, as I should yeah, say. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, well, that's very nice of JD to include his friend. I'm like, yeah, they're, they're just snapping in his ears, you know, yeah. gazing at the wall. <laughs> I need you to, I need someone to wave at me to know when I'm supposed to walk down the aisle. <laughs> Oh, that was a good time. It was a great time. It makes for a yeah. good story, you know. It does. That's what life's about, stories. Agreed. So there's a question I've been meaning to ask you. I don't know if I already have. You know, I've got the worst memory ever. Uh, mm-hmm. You're a massive soccer fan. Correct. We played soccer early in, like, kindergarten, first grade. I dipped. You kept playing. Mm-hmm. How did you settle on Manchester United as your team? Um, It was probably back in about 19... 19- 1998, 1999, when I okay. got that PlayStation 1, I think it was probably uh-huh. at that time period. And I had FIFA 98 or 99, or it might have even been the the year before, because, well, we maybe not have got the new games when they came out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Relatable. But I just started playing with Manchester United on that game. And ever since then, I've been a fan and I never really even got a chance to watch any of their games until about 2013 mm-hmm. when uh, our cable provider started airing them. And uh, I don't know that I've missed a game ever since. It re- So it was just random? You just got FIFA and was like, ah, this is red. I like red. Yep. Really? Yeah. That's, I mean, here, there, <laughs> soccer's not a big thing, especially where we're at. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, kind of, that's where my love for them started, and it really – you know, that was always my go-to team in FIFA mm-hmm. growing up. And then uh, as I start was, you know, when the Premier League came on to our cable network, 
I was able to start watching them. And again, I I mean, I just finished a game that was on it. It started at 10 this morning and I wasn't home until 1230. But as soon as I got home, I put it on and we lost. It was a bad game. <laughs> We're not doing too hot right now. Oh, no. You know, I, I, I came in, I started finally getting to watch them after the glory years, you know. Do you do you watch do you watch old games? Um, I watch old clips. Yeah, makes sense. Cause you watch a shit ton of football. Yes, I remember because I I follow the World Cup when that comes around every few years because mm-hmm. I don't have like a team. So, but when the World Cup comes, I love the idea that countries are battling. I'm like, that's so cool. But yes. you you watch every single match. That's like sixty games. Yes, yeah, I'll record every match throughout the day if I can't watch it at work. And then as soon as I get home, I start playing them, and I don't look at the scores. That way, it's uh, entertaining the whole time. I can't watch a game that I already know the score to, and that's why I don't really watch older games. Oh, um, sure. Smart. Yeah, but uh, the uh, it, it's also when you can sit there and watch three or four games that were in the group stage throughout the day and spend six hours at night watching them and sure. staying up till about three in the morning to make sure you finish them all <laughs> falling asleep and then having to start them back over and stuff like that but that's what you do i pre- i appreciate the commitment yeah that's that's a diehard <laughs> fan yep that's so funny that it was just a random ps1 pick that gave you the lifelong tutelage of being a manchester united fan i know it's crazy ain't it i'm pretty <laughs> sure it was PlayStation one um, yeah <laughs> pretty sure it was playstation one Dude, who's so I don't know a whole lot about the different leagues and like the mm-hmm. rivalry. Who who is Manchester United's like go to rival? Well, you got Man City, which yeah, they're a couple blocks away. Mm, um sure. Yeah. And then you got Arsenal, which uh I've heard of they, them. They you know that that's an older rivalry. And both those clubs are some of the most um declarated in England, along with Liverpool. Sure. Um you know that, that those three right there in Chelsea are the probably the biggest rivals. Well, for you know City, Arsenal, sure, Chelsea, Liverpool, um, City. You know they've been around a long time as well, but they've just really in the past ten years really stepped their game up and become the best team in England. You know they won last year. They won the treble, which is the league, the FA Cup. And the Champions League, Dude. all in one season. Um, we have done it once. I think it was in 2012. I think, or it might have been a little, a little before that time. But Man United has done it once. Not many teams in Europe that have won a trouble because that's a lot. Yeah, you know, you're talking about 80 games in, in in the course of a year to do that. Oh God. Is that a normal thing in the league to play that many games? Like, or uh, so, how does that work? So, the league you play in the Premier League, they play thirty-eight games. There's twenty teams in the league. You play everyone twice. Okay. And um, and then you've got your cup matches, which you know depends on how far into the cups you go. But you got two or two, maybe three, um, uh, English cups that they play in. Mm-hmm. And then that adds games on, and then they can either be playing Champions League or Europa League um, matches, which is, you know, the Champions League is the top four teams out of England, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. Um, There there may be two teams that go from each country up to four. It just depends on how big the the country is. And they're playing those games – in correspondence with uh, league play and other cup matches. Ooh, that's a lot. So they could have a game on a, thir- a Champions League game on a Thursday and a league game on a Saturday or Sunday, two days later. My God. Yeah. The cardio that these guys can do. Yeah. And not to mention they could be flying from England to somewhere in Spain to play, you know, that game yeah. on Thursday and then getting back and then two to three days later playing another match. Ooh. I have found that I I enjoy watching soccer the most out of all the sports. Me too. I really like it. I love the noise of the yeah. crowd, and I love the the unpredictability of yeah. it. Yeah, you know, you could be just like it happened. You know, we were down one zero the whole game. We got a goal with a minute 
and a half left. And then, um, you know, we were putting the pressure on them pretty good. And all of a sudden the other team got, got a chance in the 95th minute, which was, you know, five minutes of stoppage time and, uh, got a goal and finished the game off. And, you know, when we looked like we were on the front foot, it turned real fast. You know, yeah. it be a, split. <laughs> a lot of other sports, you can see the buildup of, you know, points scored coming, but on soccer, it could be a complete 180 real fast. Yeah. And like, the thing I always liked about soccer was number one, it's so hard to score. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge deal. Whereas like with, with American football, you can, you can push your way to the goal line. You know, like this way, if you get real close and like get the down nearest to the goal line, like just, just brute force your way in. It's possible. Mm-hmm. There's such like technical precision required to soccer to score. That's why people go nuts when you do score and you can go an entire game, nil, nil at the end. Like, just, yes, nuts so i I always like that that. and that nil nil game could be a very exciting game you know there could have been you know 15 to 20 shots with 10 to 15 saves you know yeah on each side and it's just a nail-biting game who's going to score the first goal and well no one does right that's so exciting yeah i kind of i kind of described it i'm like imagine american football but there's an interception every like 10 seconds yeah yeah that's about the most exciting part of american football it's so exciting. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't understand it, but it is a, it's an awesome sport. Yeah. I would argue a lot of Americans don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, the rest correct. of the world yeah. seems to be on the right page. <laughs> yeah, that's a good argument. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the world knows what it is. How was it? Because uh, you actually went to a game. Yes. To yes. see we them play to- in person. Yes, it was in Washington, D.C., which is like their summer. They always do a summer tour. Sometimes it's, you know, in Asia or, you know, America or, you know, just another continent usually is where they go for them. Um, It was very exciting. It wasn't the feeling that you would get at a league level or a cup level. Sure. Um. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot different. You know, they can make as many substitutions as they want. It's for the manager and the team to, you know, figure out new tactics, um, you know, okay. bring youth, youth players up into the fold to see how they're doing, you know, because you, your, your teams have multiple levels. You know, some of these players that play for Manchester United have played for them since they were seven or eight years old. Dude. And they, and they just come up the ranks and – uh it's a good time to do that and any new signings that they make over the summer, you know, to kind of sure. get them match ready. Cause they take a little bit of time off. Um, mm-hmm. you know, they might get four to six weeks off. Okay. And then, a and then year? they're back at the like, yeah, a year. <laughs> Cause usually there may be a two week break in the season here or there, but usually when there's a two week break, they're doing international games and that's why there's a two week break. Gotcha. Yep. So what the game that you got to see was like, it was a game, but it was also kind of like test run and like trying stuff out, like watching a comedian work on jokes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of a a glorified scrimmage, as I will call it. Okay, um, still and they pretty cool. AC. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's cool, and it's kind of, you know, and the you don't there's you don't the urgency isn't there in the mm-hmm. game, you know, whether they win or lose, you know, they want to win, but whether they win or lose, it's there's nothing on the line. Right. Um, there's no like stakes. Yeah, but it is also cool, too, because they will play, you know, the whole squad. You know, a lot of times at halftime, they'll rotate the whole squad and put a whole, you know, 11 oh, different players cool. on. So you get to see everyone play, you know. Yeah, and people you wouldn't and, normally get to see play. Yeah, correct. And, that's um, cool. Which is, which is really cool. And, you know, they played AC Milan in that game, and it went to penalties, and they won, you know. Okay, that's fun. Which and they won. It was a little. Uh, I think it was the Guinness Cup, is what they called it. Sweet. Um, you know, they played like four matches, and each there was like six or eight teams in it. You know, and they played. I think it was four matches or five matches each, and they they ended up winning it, which was pretty cool. But it was it was a fun experience. You know, my dream is to make it over to England and go to Old Trafford one day. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, that's that's my dream. But I think if I made it there, I probably wouldn't come home. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. If I could live on the streets and go to a game every weekend, that that would be amazing. 
Yeah, we can figure it out. Just yeah. have Ollie grow up, make a bunch of money, and then he can fund the adventures. You and Brittany That's the become plan. vagabonds. That's the plan. I'm in. Full on soccer hooligans. It's what you were <laughs> destined for, JD. <laughs> but, but we can't be hooligans. Hooliganism is uh illegal. Pretty yes, a pretty big issue over there. <laughs> right, right, right. No, no, no. The the American version of one. Yes, you know? <laughs> that that'll work. And, and I don't yeah, that... really want to get beat up either. Yeah. <laughs> we're too old for that. Yes. So 90, 98. So what, we were seven? Because you were born in 91 as well, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. You're only a few months older than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a long time to be a fan of a single club. It is. Especially one that's like, I, I've always loved your love of soccer because it's so different, especially being an American, especially in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not, you tell people you're a soccer fan, uh, you're not greeted with the best feedback afterwards. <laughs> no, they're like, oh, that's a boring sport. Right? It's like, oh, you just don't get it. My, well, my answer is they don't watch the right soccer. That's right. I know I'll have haters for this, but, you know, American soccer is not that great compared to European soccer. Yeah, right. It, it really is. It's not as entertaining. It's true. There's just not the respect. That's what it is. Yeah. And uh, sitting, there, sitting there one night playing Halo. I kind of told a professional MLS player that same thing, and I didn't know that the guy played MLS. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I was playing FIFA. They were playing Halo, and he said, well, what team are you using? And I was like, Manchester United. He's like, oh, what's your favorite team? I said, Man United. He's like, what about <laughs> your favorite American team? I'm like, well, I don't really watch it much. It's kind of boring. He's like, oh, I played for um, – Oh. Yeah, it, who did he play? He played for uh, FC Dallas, I think, is what it is. Oh. So, yeah, he was a defender. I was like, well, open Ooh. mouth and foot. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, he's got to know. Yeah. Come on now. And Let's like, be honest. At, and at the same time, you know, he's sitting there playing Halo at 7 o'clock at night and not training. I'm like, Yeah, exactly. See? Yeah. That's what, that's what we're talking about. There's that, that yeah. cultural respect for the sport that other countries have. Yes. Commitment. Yeah. Yeah, and just that that level of athleticism is just insane to me. Like, how many miles are they running every game? A lot. A yes. lot, and against yeah. other people. And, like, I see those clips every now and then when, like, a ball will go super astray, and then a coach will just, like, catch it with his ankle. And like, it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah. I'm like, man, just to have that, like, depth perception, to know where the ball is, to know how to intercept it, to not use your hands. I mean, that's – it's amazing. It takes talent. Yeah. And I found out uh, I went to watch uh, my boss's kid play soccer a few years back. And he was 11, I think, at the time. And mm -hmm. I noticed that, like, on corner kicks and stuff, they were playing, they were just passing them in. And I said, What's going on? And I'm like, Why don't they cross them into the box? He said, Well, they can't use their head. And I'm like, You mean to tell me they can't use their head in this sport? They said no because you know they could get hurt, and I was like, "Well, there's the problem with American soccer, right? <laughs> Do you want the goal or not?" Yeah, that, I mean that's half that's that's half the sport is using your head. Yeah, and also, isn't it kind of funny when you think about it? Because it's like we don't want them using their head on a soccer ball, but we'll put a helmet on them and have them crash into each other playing kids football. I was like, "Correct, that's way, that's way worse for the CTE man." What are yeah. we doing? I mean, you got seven year olds playing tackle football. Yeah, it's like, what are we doing? Yeah. Which I'm not against at all, but it's like no, let them fight. Head in, in in the soccer match, right? Let, let's be let's be even across the board. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. See who comes out with that brain injury. It's gonna be it's gonna be the football over the soccer for sure. I would think so. So you you mentioned you mentioned your boss. You work at a marina. Mm -hmm. You've been working at a marina since we were kids. Yes. How did you get that job? Um, let's see, the boss's nephew, I was a friend of him, and my mom was their little girl's teacher, and it just kind of worked out, and I started there at 15, and I'm still there, so I'm working on 18 years now. Ooh, look at us, men of commitment. I've been doing my job for yeah. 15 this year. Yep. What is wrong with us, J.D.? I don't know, man. <laughs> we got bills. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what happened. How, so, did, are you doing the same thing that you were doing when you started, or has your job changed? 
Um, it's about the same. Um, yeah. so what do you, you do? Know, break down a day for me. Break down a day. Let's see. On a busy day, you know, we get a lot of transient boats, big yachts, you know, all the way up to 160 feet. Uh, cruise ships, you know, what? big commercial vessels, all sorts of stuff. And they all come in for one night usually and uh so on a busy day i'm about on the phone for two hours in the morning confirming every reservation and um lining up you know we full time side by side so we're lining up rafts as we call them when you raft them together mm -hmm. um you know we actually have two marinas one on each side of the canal so i'm delegating which vessel goes to which side you know what depend on what they need um if they're going to go into our restaurant all that you know there's there's a lot of specifics that go into it so it's about a two-hour logistical puzzle to mm -hmm. get everyone in and then i get my crowd going on their daily tasks and by about after lunch the boats start showing up and then you'll have more call and more cancel so you go through and you do it all over again and rework the puzzle to get everyone fit tie them all up and then uh try to go home and enjoy the evening and turn around and go do it again the next day <laughs> so the the boats are the, they're coming in for supplies for fuel for food what uh what's service? yeah su supplies we have a big ship store um you know they get fuel they stay the night they go into our restaurant and then uh most of the time they're out by the time we get in in the morning so it's a clean slate and we do it all again. You know, I've met a lot of friends doing it over the years. You know, sure. I'd say about 70% of the boaters, you know, I know them by, uh, by their boat and by their face. I can't say I remember everyone's name, but I right. remember quite a few. So I, are they private boats? Are they like commercial boats and you're just like a rest stop along uh, the way? 90% of them are private. Um, okay. And, I'd say half of them have the owners on board and the other half are just being delivered by a boat captain. Oh, okay. Or captain and crew. I've like no frame of reference for this like ecosystem, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a diverse ecosystem. You know, you might have, you know, a boat that has a captain and some crew on it and the owners, you know, mm -hmm. it may just be the captain and crew. And then there's captains that just move boats, you know, They'll hop on a boat, take it south, hop on a plane, go back up, grab another one, take it south, you know, and just rotate them. Oh, what a job. Yeah. Imagine if that's what you did for a living, just like transporting boats. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That'd be pretty neat. You know, I've done some trips here or there with buddies, you know, that needed help. Sure. And it's a good time. That's cool. So you guys are basically like a nautical rest stop. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like the, the, the biggest truck stop on the... ICW. I wouldn't say we're the biggest marina, but you know, we get a, just, unless people go offshore, they have to come past us. Right. Right. There, there's one other route, but it's not taken very often. It's a skinny route and it's not great for motor yachts and stuff like that. It's, it's good for sailboats um, just cause mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're full keel and sure. uh, if they bump a log, they can kind of just push it out of the way. But when the boats have the propeller sticking out the back, they don't really like to go that way. Ah, uh, okay. And it's a slow, it's a slow route too. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Like to think that you would need, as you're moving a boat, you'd have to plan out these sort of rest stops. Yes. To refuel and do whatever. Yeah. Cause I mean, when we're busy, you know, if you don't call us a day or two in advance, you know, chances are you may not get a spot. Oh, do you guys have a season like we do down here where it's like a few months is super busy and then it's like dead? Yeah, we have two seasons. Um, really, mid April till the end of June, mm -hmm. and, and then mid September till about Thanksgiving. Okay, and then what is it? Is it just like too cold in the winter? People aren't on boats. Yeah, they're um they're on boats, but they're already south. You know, we do get some oh, here sure. or there this time of the year, and the summer stays pretty busy. It's not crazy busy, but it's steady. Uh huh. But you know, they're going. In the fall, they're going from north to south to get away from the cold. Right. And then in the spring, they're headed back north. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Do you find where where do most of like are they? Do you call them clients? What do you call them? The people that come through. 
Oh, a word for him? Boaters. Boaters. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> right on the nose. Uh, yeah. did, where do you find most of the boaters are from? They're from all over. Um, really? Mm-hmm. And and you can look at the back of the boat and it might say they're, you know, they're from Florida, but that's just where they have the boat registered. They may be from Oregon. You know, you never know. They're from all over the place. Really? So these like yeah. northern people, a lot of times will just take their boat and just go down the Atlantic coast. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, they'll use their boat for only four to five months out of the year. You know, I got a good friend that, you know, he lives in Colorado. And oh, uh, there's no water there. You know, no, no. And <laughs> maybe some lakes. But, uh, and, you know, he'll use, he'll, let's see, in the spring, he'll take his boat up north. They'll do a little bit of the Chesapeake Bay. Then they'll leave it and go back home for the summer. And then they'll go pick it up um, early fall and take it back south and leave it in Florida and go back to Colorado. Huh. What a life. Yeah. Very different than my existence. Yes. They bounce all around. It's pretty cool. I mean, you got to like your job. You've been doing it for 18 years. Yeah. It's it's a good job. Pays the bills. Could be worse. It, it could be worse. And yes, it does. Uh, it pays the bills and allows me... The freedom to pursue my woodworking business. Yeah. So, how, where did this come from? Because it seemed pretty random when you started. <laughs> well, I've always liked making things. And, you know, I was always kind of the DIY guy in our first mm-hmm. house. And, um, you know, had to do everything myself. And, yeah. You know, my uncle, he, he was always on his lathe, and every time I'd go visit, you know, we would turn a bowl or, you know, something cool. Yeah. And that's where, like, it really started. And from there, it's just expanded, and it got to the point where the things I was making, I couldn't find enough people to give them to. So I decided, well, let's start making things and trying to sell them. And it has progressively grown and gotten better every year. And um, as you know, my skills have evolved, my tools have evolved, and I can just bring more to the table. Yeah, literally. And pretty much create anything that anyone is interested in having. We do a lot of epoxy work, which mm-hmm. is fun, um, keeps things interesting, and uh, it's very colorful, and people love it. Yeah. So your uncle started it. So like you saw him doing it, and you're like, oh, I could do that. Yeah, it kind of started with, you know, he really just did a lot of, you know, wood turning and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then we started incorporating epoxy into the wood turning. And, um, you know, you would, if you had a a chunk of wood, you pour some epoxy in there and then you turn into a bowl and it's, you know, got wood and epoxy in it and it looks really cool. Sure. And then we kind of started messing around with making charcuterie boards the same way, you know, with epoxy in them. Mm-hmm. and from there that's when it really developed and you know as much as i love getting on the lathe and turning something i might get to do it once or twice a year because oh. we're so busy everything else so wood turning is that thing i've seen where they like drill the little thing into the log and then it just spins really fast and you just stick the thing and kind of do that and like chip yeah. stuff off that's wood turning yeah yeah that okay. that's um that's it in a nutshell Okay. I've seen a lot. I watch a shit ton of those videos because like yeah, those and like, you ever see those like rug cleaning videos? Yeah, they're pretty sad. So oh, I, I can't stop. It's like 15 <laughs> minute videos. I got to watch all of it. It's a, it's a disease yeah. I have. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty satisfying. Like right? Pressure washing and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like all black. You don't even know what it is. And then like they have to go through 20 different, you know, soaps and pools to get it done and by the end it looks brand new you're like oh my god look at that it's so cool i have the same thing with wood turning i'll see people do like uh like color pencils you seen that Mm -hmm. they like put a bunch of color pencils and then make a block of resin and just like turn it into a bowl or a lamp yeah we've tried that and you know we got real funky with it we were using we would take popcorn and uh oh you know put it in pressure pot and force resin into it and make it a hard block and then you could turn a popcorn bowl out of popcorn or cereal bowl out of cereal oh that's cool what's the weirdest thing you've done so far um weirdest thing uh we tried to uh put some of those marshmallow peeps in some epoxy 
<laughs> and, and turn a bowl out of them. But when the epoxy had its chemical reaction, it just melted the peeps and made a big mess. Oh, no. <laughs> I love that's that you probably, tried it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the weirdest thing. You know, we we were just like at a point, you know, we were just sticking anything we possibly could in the epoxy and <laughs> trying to, try to see what would happen, you know? Why not? That's where the real fun is. <laughs> yeah, and and we, well, I wanted to do more and, you know, epoxy is not cheap. And that's ah. where I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll make some charcuterie boards and try to sell them. And, you know, I started, you know, selling a few one here, one there, one here, one there. And now fortunately the orders come in weekly and we make, you know, epoxy charcuterie boards, live edge cutting boards. I just finished a clock yesterday. Dude. Um, you know, and signs, you know, I'm working on, I got a sign right now that I'm working on that, you know, glows in the dark. The Ooh. epoxy does. So, and, uh, small furniture and, actually about to start a uh a big bar job it's about 60 foot of bar tops Dude. for a local restaurant yeah i just had a guy you know pick up a, a cutting board yesterday and called me 20 minutes later and said hey can you get two more ready for me by next week so that's what is being worked on today that get way i can it. have them ready by next week for him that's so exciting mm -hmm. did you did you expect that sort of like when you're built, because you you think ahead, you're you're that guy. we are like you you you're two steps man. Yes. So when you're when you're thinking about this sort of woodworking business, did you think it would take this amount of time to kind of get some feet, but underneath it and people ordering more than one thing? Yes, I, I knew it would take time, and honestly, I thought it would take more time than it has. Sure. Uh, we've been very fortunate, you know. You know, I had one order that um, it was kind of funny how it came in. And, it started with me selling a miniature golf course that we had uh, here, a, like a portable one mm -hmm. to a guy. And he asked why I was selling it. And I was like, well, I want to fund a CNC machine for the shop. And he was like, what's that? So I brought him into the shop to show him what, you know, kind of what I do and what the CNC could do to provide, you know, faster work. Mm -hmm. And he saw a board sitting here and then he asked, you know, can you do some of those with names on them? And I'm like, Oh yeah. You know, that's why I bought the CNC was to do inlays, you know, carve it and then fill it with epoxy with people's names or logos of their businesses. Just anything that you think you want on something, we can put it on there. And uh, that order, it started out as three boards and a couple sets of coasters. And then before I could finish the three, he ordered two more and then another two. And then another one. So I think he did a total of three, four, seven, eight boards and like Ooh. six sets of coasters. And, um, you know, before I could even finish one, he was ordering another one because he would think of someone else he wanted to make one for. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, Dude. We've done some, you know, like beer flights for local uh, bars and stuff like that. That was a pretty big order we did. That was a 60 piece order. Oh, uh, 60? Six zero? Yeah, 60. Yeah, we did uh, 40 paddle flights and um, and then they had they sell eight different kinds of beers that they brew. So they wanted to do eight. And so that's what we did. We did some round ones as well for them. Dude, how long did that take? Um, I did that in about three weeks. Uh, and we were actually quite busy at work that time. So my uncle came in and he gave me about three days of just milling lumber, you know? Sure. And um, he just milled lumber for three days straight while I was at work. And then, you know, by the time I got home, he was ready to relax and I'd come into the <laughs> truck, start gluing up all the, you know, cause we did them, you know, kind of like your cutting board style where you use multiple species and uh, glue them together. And then, you know, we had all these blanks and then I made some templates and just started on the router table, you know, carving them all out and, and then drilling all the holes for the little, uh, four ounce glasses to sit in. And it was, it was a production, you know? Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. And I would rather do, you know, like I'd rather do five cutting boards at one time than just one at a time. Cause once you get set up, you know, you can roll into that production. Sure. So at, at this point, what are like your favorite things to make? Like when an order comes in, you're like, oh, awesome. Another charcuterie board, another flight. Um, uh, I, my favorite thing to make now is something different. 
Yeah, there we go. There's that artist. Uh, yeah. You know, I like, you know, like charcuterie boards. They're fun, um, mm -hmm. especially when people want a color that's not, you know, popular. Sure. That that really is awesome, you know, because you get to try something different. You know, a lot of people love the blues and the greens and, right. I, and beautiful. And that's why. But when someone says, hey, can you do a red one? Yeah, I'd like to do red. Or, you know, I started messing with this silver color that almost looks like mercury. Cool. And uh, I did it for a couple people. And then that one got real popular, you know, with the walnut. Because you got like this silver with the dark, you know, wood. And that got real popular. And it kind of, after about 20 of them, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to sell some other colors now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But I went through that phase. Uh you know, Lazy Susans are awesome, too, you know. Yeah. Um, but I've been doing uh, these live edge cutting boards. You know, I've done two or three of those in the past two weeks. Oh. And uh, and then, you know, I'm starting to add, like, uh, different things to them, you know, like juice grooves, which is the groove that goes around the top. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, on a normal cutting board, if you, if you create the right template, you know, they're pretty easy. But when you got a live edge, it makes it a lot more difficult because it's not a perfect rectangle. Oh, sure. To put your, your template. So you really have to be precise with it, and it's challenging. It's nerve-wracking because you, you're taking a router bit and you're trying to do a groove around something that's pretty much already to the finished process. And if you mess it up, you, you kind of got to start all over. Oh, my God. It could be, you know, they're challenging, um, a little nerve-wracking. but yeah. The more of them you do, the more it's like instinct. You kind of get in the um, groove of it. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I, I, I don't really have a favorite project. Like I said, a favorite project will be something different, you know? Sure. I, I like it when someone comes to me with an idea, and especially when they say, you know, just do it, you know? Yeah. This is what I want. You know what you're doing. You know what you, you know, what looks good together. Just do it. Yeah. That like artistic trust. Yes. I'm into that. Yeah. But I think the favorite, my favorite thing to do in the shop is organize. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. It's therapeutic, you know, clean. And, you know, I try to clean in between each step or every other step of a project. Cause if I got stuff all over the place, it drives me nuts. And yeah, I'm sitting there working on a project thinking like, I need to clean this. I need to put this back where it goes. So sure. For the most, most part, my shop stays pretty tidy and uh, it's therapeutic to, get organization into it i bet and and it just makes the jobs easier because you're not you know having to work around a mess or try and find mm -hmm. the tools and stuff you know where it's at that said though like how do you pick the wood like did you have to did you have to try different kinds of wood to find out which one works better for different things um you know i kind of go off of you know usually when an order comes in you know I'll ask someone, do they like lighter wood? Do they like darker wood? You know, sure. Aesthetics. And, exactly. And then you kind of want to pair the, if you're doing like epoxy or something with it, you know, um, you don't want to do too dark of an epoxy with a darker wood. It doesn't really pop. Sure. And vice versa. Um, there, my, I'll, my favorite woods are walnut and, like spalted maple those are probably my two favorites to work with oh okay how come um well walnut's just beautiful and the yeah. grain can get you know really crazy like I, I got a slab here that i'm going to be doing a desk out of and i'm looking at it right now and i see purples in it and re you know reds in it and it's just and and they're not bright purple or bright red but it's just the the different rays or color in it is really cool sure and um spalted uh maple is really cool spalting is where the the wood is actually in a decaying state after it's been wet oh. and you know some of it you know it can be too soft but if you catch it at the right time it has these really cool black streaks through it and cool. it just highlights the grain pattern um ambrosia maple is pretty cool too it's pretty much the same thing spalting is decaying and then anything that's ambrosia is where a beetle has dug into it and they leave these black streaks behind. That's cool. And these little holes all over it, which is pretty cool. But you know, we do, we deal with all kiln dried wood that way it kills any beetle or larva or anything that's in it. Mm -hmm. And it dries to 
you know, workable moisture content. That sure. way it doesn't warp down the road. Oh, that's smart. I didn't, I never would have thought of that. Are they, are these things you've had to learn the hard way? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And lots of research. Um, yeah. But I, I think if I've had to pick one wood to rule them all, it would be Clara Walnut. Oh, or, okay. or, or, which is a walnut that is really only in um, Northern uh, California and Oregon. Okay. Okay. It's, it's a lot darker than your traditional American walnut or black walnut. And it's mm -hmm. really, it's got really cool grain in it. Um, that's actually the charcuterie board you got is Claro. Oh, sweet. Those were the first sticks that I made. I knew I had walnut, but after, you know, I've got, so then, you know, we were just taking slabs of wood and pouring epoxy in the middle and sanding them down. And, uh, but now I kind of, I pre-finish everything before I even pour it. Uh, that way I know what I'm working with. Cause one, you know, I did six on that first run mm -hmm. and, um, we did one and it was really cool cause we did like this orange color in there and never even realized until after we sanded it down after we poured the orange epoxy that it had orange streaks in the wood. Oh, cool. So like complimented it. Yeah. Just like a fun accident. Yep. Yep. And I didn't even, we didn't realize until, like I said, until we got it sanded down pretty. We didn't realize what we had, which was Clara Walnut, and I had bought a ton of it. And now <laughs> I'm just sitting on it because I'm waiting for the right projects. Okay. Okay. What is there a wood that you've worked with that you hate now? <laughs> um, pine. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and cedar. I, I, I don't like pine or cedar. Oh, no. Um, Your thing is well, called Cedar Bay Woodworks, JD. I know. I know. That's, <laughs> I mean, cedar. Okay, cedar is fine. It smells great. It's easy. No, no, to don't work back with. out now. We're yeah. committing. <laughs> well, I'm telling you what I don't like about it. Um, right. Let's be yeah, fair it, to the cedar. <laughs> yeah, and that's not why it's called Cedar Bay Woodworks. The okay. uh, probably best. Yeah, the cedar <laughs> again. Cedar is pretty. It's just soft, you know. And most of the stuff I uh, do, you know, woods for, you know, sure. anything you be cutting on or banging around, it, it's just going to dent and it's not going to hold up like you know your hardwoods would sure um the the name comes from the road we live on is called cedar bay court and oh yeah you know, and then in our backyard is cedar bay which is you know a small body of water right behind us so it mm -hmm. kind of just it worked out you know it that's where the uh that's where the name came from okay okay and why don't we like pine uh, it's just construction grade material. <laughs> I mean, granted, all my workbenches and everything is made out of pine, but it's another thing. It's not, you know, it's a softwood. Sure. And it, it, it has its uses, you know, it's good for, you know, signs and flags and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's really easy to work with. Um, but it's just, it's your everyday building material. Sure. It's not quite up to par for art. No. <laughs> yeah. Now you can that. make awesome things with it, you know, like all the flags and stuff we make, you know, we use pine. Um, because you're gonna stain it and uh right or paint it or you know, it's good for that aspect of things. But when you're making, you know, cutting boards, charcuterie boards, furniture, you know, you really want to use hardwoods. Oh, uh, okay. Because they're just made better. Are they made they're not made, they're trees. They're they're created. Well, created, that's the word. Yes, they're created better. Sturdier yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, and and like, you know, the the fibers are tighter on them and stuff. So it just, it makes for a better product at the end of the day. Gotcha. Yeah. Have you been defeated by a board yet? Been defeated? Yeah, where you're like, the, the, the wood just didn't work. It didn't want to mess with you. And you're like, I hate this now. I've been defeated a lot. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of and, and a lot of projects I do, I feel defeated on halfway through them, and even at the end because it didn't turn out exactly the way it was right. in my head. But at the end of the day, the customer's happy, and that's all that matters, you know. Yeah, spoken like a true artist turned businessman. <laughs> yeah, and, and really, I'm a perfectionist. You know, if yeah, if I quote a a project, then you know my quote it's got twenty hours of labor. Mm -hmm. I probably put 30 to 40 into it, but that's because I want it to be 
perfect, you know? Yeah. Is there is there a piece that you've done so far that you're like super proud of? Like the crown jewel at the moment? Um, um the la- the last cutting board I did was I was pretty happy with because that was really, you know, my first go at doing juice grooves and stuff like that. And for it to be on a on a live edge piece, it turned out pretty awesome. Um, I was pretty proud of that. Uh, some of the uh, bigger epoxy, you know, cutting or not cutting boards, but charcuterie boards that I've done with, you know, carved inlays and stuff like that. I did a really cool Lazy Susan mm-hmm. that had a big carving in it. Those, I was pretty proud of those. Um, you know, you get proud of something that you just did. And then two weeks later, you one up yourself and yeah. you're proud of it. So it's, it's kind of hard, you know, to sure. say the, I think when I'm done with this desk that I'm, you know, staring at this slab, I think that'll probably be, you know, my one of my prouder pieces because I I got some cool designs that I'm going to use for the legs. You know, I'm going to hand make everything out of, you know, walnut instead of, you know, slapping it on a metal base. Sure. And going, yeah, you know, the metal bases look cool and they're easy and stuff, but I want to do this one as kind of a showcase piece and test my abilities. That's how you grow. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Have you made a desk before? I have not. That's even cooler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pure creativity. Yeah. And I haven't really done any major furniture. You know, I've done some, you know, small things and stuff like that, but something like that I've never done before. Is that something you want to do? Like get into bigger furniture? Oh, I would much rather be doing larger furniture and larger scale items. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. Just share like time spent. On like a specific product, like do one of those a month versus like, you know, 30 tiny things. Exactly. That's exactly, you know, on a business, you know, you can be really creative with the small stuff Mm -hmm. and, you know, you got to have that balance. You know, I I would love to be doing one. Yeah, you're right there, buddy. (laughs) One one large project that really um, tests me, you know, at a time and tests my abilities and makes me better while also doing smaller things that, you know, are kind of natural now. Sure. And fun, you know, because you'll get frustrated on a big, pro- you know, on some projects, especially if you've never done it before. Oh, yeah. You know, you'll get frustrated in a heartbeat. And sometimes you just got to walk away and let it sit there for a week and stare at it. And then you'll figure out, okay, this is a way to do this. Sure. So where do you get your wood? Oh, I get it. I order a lot of the small stuff online. A lot of it comes out of Canada. Nice. Um, for the charcuterie boards and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I can get it dropped here, you know, and it's already milled down, ready to, you know, put in a mold and go from there and pour epoxy in there. You know, it's ready. I might have to clean it a little bit, you know, get some bark or something off, but it's already ready to go. Um, and I can get it actually cheaper drop to me like that at my doorstep then i can go buy a slab cut it down mill it and all that stuff oh, so interesting. On, yeah on a business standpoint it's it's more economical you know sure the time the time over money is well spent that way right and on the everything else you know i've got a couple local guys here right you know within a 30 minute radius that you know one of them you know i can get kiln dried stuff from another guy he has a a sawmill and i can get some stuff from him whether it be wet or you know he's got a small kiln that we could put stuff in i just went there today and got some burl uh slabs maple no yeah maple and uh we put them in the kiln so they'll be ready in a couple months to do something with a couple months it takes that long to dry them? And that's fast, you know. Really? Normally, yeah, when you cut a, a, you know, when you cut boards down, that's usually, if you just let it air dry in a climate-controlled shop like mine, it's usually about an inch per year. Oh, my God. Well, I should say a year per inch. Yeah. You know? um, the kiln what? will accelerate that pretty well, and the kiln also will help, you know, kill any bugs that might be living in there. That's crazy. So the process is... There are trees, you cut the trees down, you cut the tree into boards, and then you dry the boards? Correct. Oh, okay. And drying takes forever. That's nuts. 
So do people by and large they use they're using a kiln, like a pottery kiln to to dry the boards? No, it's like um same word. You know, like thing. a solar kiln are pretty much like a greenhouse almost. Oh, okay. They're very similar to a greenhouse. Um with fans and stuff in there to get the moisture out. Gotcha. Instead of keeping moisture in like a greenhouse. Right. And then um, you know, those are your, you know, kind of your your home kilns that people like I'm we're about to build one on our property. Cool. Smart. That way and you know, we can take care of it ourselves. Yeah. And then but there I mean there's kilns that will dry, you know, stacks and stacks of lumber in a couple weeks time. Whoa. You know, they're 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 regulated. There's, you know, dehumidifiers in them, there's fans and they come on and off when it's at, you know, a certain temperature and stuff like that. So they're pretty cool. Something I probably will never venture into <laughs> just the cost on them. Yeah. Sounds like overhead will be a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's they're they're expensive. But who knows? You know, you never know. Man, I've never thought about that. Cause again, I have no frame of reference for this whole thing. So okay. So what happens if you don't? Like if you got the trees down, you got them into boards, have you messed with not kiln dried wood? Or it's just not smart too? I have, but I try to stay away from it. You know, yeah. Like some of my stuff, like this, the Claro I have in here was all air dried, I think, but it's set for six years, you know. Ooh. And and if it's stickered properly, because a lot of times, you know, if you dry it too fast, they can twist and crack. Oh, okay. If you build anything with lumber that has too much moisture in it, it'll start, it'll warp, you know, when you put it in your house at 70 degrees. Gotcha. Hence, you want to dry it out. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, fortunately enough, I've got a climate controlled shop. So everything that comes in here stays around, you know, 65 to 72 degrees. Mm -hmm. And when it goes into someone's house, you don't get that. You know, you might get a little movement, but you won't ever notice it because wood's always moving. Right. You know, unless it's like 100 years old and it can still move. You right. Know, <laughs> you, you can cut a board on a table saw that's been dried and then. You know, if it's thin enough after you cut it, you can come back the next day and it's starting to to shift. Whoa, that's got to be kind of exciting though, because it's 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 alive essentially. Yeah, yeah. To, to kind of work with that variable, you like you never know what you're gonna get exactly, and like that's pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. And there's and there's tips and tricks to building, you know, larger scale items, you know, to keep them from moving. You know, or, you know, you want to give room to it to, for it to expand. Like when you put a metal base on a table, you want a little bit of room in there for the, the slab to co expand and contrast, you know, as the seasons change in people's houses. So you got to take that into account when you're making stuff. Yes. Dude. And now on your smaller stuff, you know, you get a little less movement, you know, especially when you got epoxy and stuff in there. Um, sure. But the epoxy can, you know, can warp too if it's in direct sunlight for extended period of time getting hot you know it can get soft and it can move it's just plastic really oh has it ha, have you ever had any issues with like the epoxy not adhering to the wood no um not to the wood no i have not had any issues with that i did uh i did have a cutting or a charcuterie board i was working on that i was running through the drum sander and uh i didn't even realize it but i was holding it and i looked down and it had bent Oh, because you got it, you know, I may have, you know, started sanding it too early and it's curing process mm -hmm. or it got hot and I looked down and it was starting to bend and I was like, oh man. So I just took it and, you know, put it on a flat surface with a bunch of weight on it. And the next day it was, you know, flat again and never had an issue with it, but it's kind of cool how you can heat it up and bend it even after it's cured. Yeah. How long does that take from the time that you pour it to when it's done? It depends. Um, you know, Every epoxy is different. Okay. Uh, most most of the charcuterie boards, Lazy Susans, all that kind of stuff that I do, they say 24 hours, but I always let it sit an extra day. Smart. A lot of times I'll pop it out of the mold in 24 hours and then kind of let it just sit so it's getting air all around it and uh, here an extra day because I've found, you know, if you're sanding it, you know, too soon, it can gum up a little bit. And at the end of the day, it's going to be hard, but it's just... It becomes more of a hassle when you're standing on it if it's not fully, fully cured and hard. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you have you ever have you ever got any on your hands? Epoxy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Is it bad? Or do you have to wear gloves? Is it dangerous at all? I don't know anything about um, it. 
I mean, any chemical is dangerous. Um, yeah, fair point. Yeah, I, I wear gloves when I, that way, more so, I, I mean, I should be worried about it getting on my hands, but I really <laughs> don't. Uh, I, I wear gloves more so in the shop, so I don't get it on something else. You know, I'll just wear like rubber gloves, you know, latex gloves. That way, like, if when I'm done pouring or something, you know, I don't turn around and grab something and I got epoxy on my hands and now it's on one of my tools. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, I, you know, I should probably practice better PPE, but <laughs> it, you know, I wear my glasses every day. That, there you that's, go. That's a given. I protect my eyes. And yeah, if I'm doing a lot of extensive chemical work or, you know, sanding or something that isn't being collected by a dust extractor or collector, you know, I wear my mask and stuff like that. But okay. For, for your average day in the shop, you know, I got glasses on, but that's about it. That's pretty important. Don't do as I do, though. Right. Where are you You're like I'm in my own shop in my own home, so there's no, there's no, there's no OSHA involved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't bring that into it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there something so like furniture? Right. You're making a. You said you're making a table next or a desk next? Desk. Desk next. What do you mm -hmm. think's going to be after that? Have you thought? Like, do you want to make? Do you want to make chairs or do you want to make shelves? Um, shelves. I actually hate making. Yeah. Um, fair. They seem like they'd be annoying. Yeah, we've got them all over the house. My lovely wife always finds some some cool looking <laughs> Pinterest stuff that she wants me yep. to make, and, uh, and 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 I do it. And yep. is it enjoyable? Parts of it, other parts <laughs> not so much. Right. Um, I, actually, I don't mind making and creating the shelves. The the part I hate about shelves is hanging them. Yeah, that that's the part I hate. Yeah, I don't blame you. But then once it once it's done, you know, you can step back and look and be like, oh, that's awesome. You know, the yep. biggest project done in our house is a huge fireplace a built out fireplace with ship lap wall and you know mm -hmm. a hundred year old oak beam that came out of a uh actually it's not oak we were going to use oak but um we found another beam that was kind of just random that we used as a mantle it's over 100 years old though that's pretty cool that that, that was a pretty cool project you know that was that was more of the, there was some woodworking involved, but it was more construction though. Sure. If that makes, it, you know, there, there, there's a little difference, you know? Oh yeah. I wouldn't say that, you know, one's easier, better than the other, but you know, woodworking, you're doing finer things. I would, is the way I would look at it. And someone might tell me I'm wrong for that, but. <laughs> I'll back you up. It's way, it's way more hands-on detail oriented working with wood there, versus like yeah, putting together. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. That was a fun project. You know, we did that right after Thanksgiving four years ago in the house. I know I got to do it. You know, I'm doing this desk, uh, end table that the, Brittany wants me to do. She's got a list of projects for the yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I tried, you know, I was actually planning on starting this desk today. But since I had to do these cutting boards, that kind of got pushed back. Sure. If we get this uh, bar job we'll be pushing the desk back another six to eight weeks. Right. Because that all hands on deck for that one. to get it done. Is there a type of wood you haven't worked with that you want to get your hands on? There's a lot of exotic woods um, yeah. that I have messed with. Um, and then there's some that I've messed with that, you know, you kind of do them for certain projects. Like Purple Heart is really cool because the wood itself is just purple. Yeah, and, it's cool. But I did a bunch of these uh, heart dishes for Valentine's Day and... You get a lot of tear out with the purple heart because it's very brittle. Oh, and okay. Had to scrap a few of those dishes, like four of those dishes that I couldn't use. Oh, no. Just because it got the tear out got so bad on them. Really? But yeah, you know, I'd like to do some Paduke and some rosewoods and stuff like that. You know, all the woods that people put in their cutting boards. And sure. And it's kind of weird because. As a woodworker, you know, it's almost like the the rite of passage to make a cutting board. Right. Like a traditional cutting board or, you know, a, a detailed one, you know, with multiple wood species. And I just really haven't done one. And I'd like to do one, um, you know, for our house, you know, just to start with. But the live edge ones I do, people really enjoy them. And that's what people really order from me. So that's what I do. Yeah. I mean, you're doing it pretty well. I've seen your stuff. Yeah. I got I got an original line one that I'm excited about. Yeah, you got you got prototype. You know? Yep. I don't want to brag, but it's there and it's <laughs> mine. Yep. That, that said, do you have like 
Do you have any advice for someone? Because I know that you're still kind of in the level up process. Like you've been doing it for a bit now, but you're also yeah. always challenging yourself and you're always learning new things. Yes. So it, is there any advice you have for someone who's like just starting to get into like woodworking? You don't have to have expensive tools. Good one. You can do it. I first started doing my stuff with a, a jigsaw, skill saw, and an orbital sander, really. Nice. Didn't have a table saw and, you know, all the all the fancy stuff. And don't be scared to do it. Just go for it. Yeah. And even if it doesn't, is it what it's pictured in your head? It's still something that you made with your hands. And every piece is a learning it, a learning piece. Yeah. You know, and the... To be honest with you, that's why I like new stuff because you learn something. But if, if I'm doing something and I've done, I did a whole project and didn't learn something, and that means it's time to try something different. That's good because that's how you grow. That's how you get better. Exactly. This year, we're really looking to expand into more, I wouldn't say commercial level stuff, but you know, we, we want to do much larger projects and have a variety, you know. We're looking at certain tools and aspects that not only I will use, but I can take someone's table and flatten it for them, you know, with these tools and have oh, smart other avenues of revenue coming in other than just making things. Sure. Expand the services kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Help other woodworkers that don't have the tools, you know, get to a level where they can work on something. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. It's also like, it's, it's a community thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. You're a good egg, JD. Yeah. That said though, uh, we've been talking for over an hour already. Look at you. Yeah. You did it. I did it. It's only eight and a half years late. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I'm about three years behind on what you want me to make for you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about a challenging learning curve. That. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Let me make a request completely outside of your uh, purview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that so that that being said uh uh before i release you back into the wild i gotta ask where can people find you online where can they find your stuff talk to me they can find us on at cedarbaywoodworks.com right now the store the online store is under construction because we're trying to get pieces added to it but with all the commission pieces i don't have as much time to just make things to have sitting around, you know, waiting for someone to buy. You can do a custom order through there or through Facebook at Cedar Bay Woodworks, Instagram. We got a pretty good TikTok going. And that's yeah, uh, not Cedar Bay Woodworks. It's uh, J Dizzle, JD, J D I L E, J D. That's my, <laughs> my tag on TikTok. We have one local store that we're in down on the Outer Banks. It's called the Salt Marsh Home. Cool. And that's about our avenues right now. This year, you know, really considering getting into the YouTube world. Sure. Trying to find some help on that, to be honest with you, because I, I, I create things with my hands, but those hands usually don't touch a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That's where it's tough for me on that. I hear you. And it's hard to sit down and take the time to edit videos and stuff like that when I could be creating something. You're too busy working. And I respect yes. it. Yeah. But the best way to, you know, get an order in or see our latest projects is via Instagram and Facebook. A lot of our TikToks we make are after the projects are done, you know. Sure. Some of them are during the project process. And I try not to post too much stuff I'm making for people until they receive it, unless they ask for updates. Because most joy I get out of a project is when I hand it over to the, the client and see their face light up that's sure that's what keeps me doing it you know yeah the money's always good but you know making people happy is the biggest thing yeah and you don't want to spoil it before it's done nope, <laughs> nope. some people like to see updates throughout the project but most people are just like you know it, it's a better factor when they when they had nothing to look at and but an idea or a concept and then they've got it in their hands and that could be you by finding cedar bay woodworks on the internet Yes. <laughs> or Jay Dizzle on <laughs> TikTok. I love that yeah. that's your thing. You know? I, really, I, really, I really should start a new Cedar Bay TikTok. Uh, I like this. <laughs> so, yeah. You got the professional like storefront, Cedar Bay Woodworks, you're in stores. Also, Jay Dizzle on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's got our logo on the picture. 
Yeah, it counts. I'll give it to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And... Yep. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show and stay up to date on new episodes, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find my demos, recent projects, and other stuff I'm up to. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. As speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on TeePublic to pick you up some sweet gear. And if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases while you're at it, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Ben, Chris, Daryl, Daz, and Victor. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.